Hey everyone, so this is the chapter 40 assisting in pediatrics lecture. We're going to walk through all of the maps for the different phases of uh, pediatric development. Today there's a lot of stuff going on with kids and so we are going to start here uh, at the very beginning with the neonate stage. So the neonatal stage uh, is birth to one month and you'll notice as we scroll through these maps that they all have the same general format. There's the physical development, general care, um, intellectual, cognitive development, and social development for each of the stages of um, childhood and so um, they all kind of look the same as we go through. So for the neonate, the physical development things that you um, should be aware of is the baby ha babies have something called fontanelles and those are what are more commonly known as the soft spots on the baby's head. And so um, babies have two of these. They are uh, very tough cartilage that will eventually calcify and fuse. And so um, what happens when a baby is being born is as it moves through the birth canal, the plates of the um, cranium or the skull actually fold uh, over one another or underneath one another um, to kind of collapse and allow the baby's head to pass through the birth canal. Um, and so they, that um, uh, soft spot is created because that cartilage is there to allow the baby to be born. Um, and uh, I mean, you can imagine that if the baby's uh, skull was as hard as um, you know, an adult skull is, it would be very difficult to get that baby's head out. And so, uh, thankfully, it um, is able to be uh, a little bit easier because of those fontanelles or because of those soft spots. And so, what happens then after the baby is born is that those, um, so the you know, the bones um, set in place and the, the soft spots or that tough cartilage eventually um, calcifies or hardens and, and they fuse together and then you have a, you know, a full skull there. Um, jaundice is another issue that sometimes uh, affects infants or neonates. It is a yellowish color of the skin caused by an accumulation of bilirubin, which is a waste product from the breakdown of red blood cells. Uh, we'll talk more about jaundice in a little while. As the baby's liver matures, um, it is able to process the red blood cells a little bit better, and then the jaundice will usually clear. Sometimes we use um, lights and things, and like I said, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the moral reflex is sometimes also known as the startle reflex and that is a reaction um, that appears to be in response to falling so the baby will sometimes just startle um, and uh, it looks like the baby thinks it's falling and so that it will, they will startle awake sometimes um, and so that reflex is there also during this birth to one month uh, age. As far as social development goes, uh, newborns become calm when they are picked up and held securely. They like to be swaddled. That can help a fussy baby calm down. Um, and then babies are really good at drowning out uh, disturbing, disturbing simulation by sleeping. Unfortunately, they don't really do that at night. They do that a lot during the day. And then they are awake at night when everybody else is drowning out disturbing things by sleeping. Um, intellectual cognitive development. So in this category, neonates can respond to stimulation and establish a preferred schedule. Uh, newborns will respond to a soft, gentle voice and they will try to focus on faces. And as far as general care goes, uh, lotions and powders are avoided for newborns. Parents are given instructions, uh, feeding instructions and details on what to expect for spit ups and bowel movements. Um, you generally learn uh, in this phase, phase that babies are gross and that they poop and that if you have a baby boy, he, you know, may hose you down and that their little butts can become literal poop rockets if they have uh, diarrhea and that they may make all these little gross noises in their diapers and um, they also projectile spit up sometimes and um, yeah, you're sleep deprived and moms are sleep deprived, dads are sleep deprived and this is the part where, um, you know, you usually stop worrying about going to the grocery store with um, baby puke on your t-shirt. 
Uh, if the baby is jaundiced, you may need to go under, the baby may, may need to go under a UV blanket or under the billy lights to help clear the jaundice. Okay, um, the next phase is the infant stage, and that is from one month all the way up to one year. So this stage lasts 11 months, um, the next 11 months of the baby's life. And so for um, this stage, we add in another factor, which is the psycho-emotional developmental factor. And so we'll start there. So babies at about one month old, they start to smile at another face. At about three months old, they smile spontaneously and display pleasure uh, in making sounds. So they start to coo and smile. At about four months old, they can vocalize a mood. Uh, at about six months old, they, they may start to um, exhibit abrupt mood changes. At about nine months old, they display pleasure um, by playing simple games. And at about a year, they've learned to express many of their emotions. And so they know how to display that they are angry or that they are happy or that they are pleased or that they are not pleased. Um, they know how to be a little dramatic. They, they can, they've learned how to express uh, many of their emotions by the time they're a year old. In order for infants to develop physically and emotionally, um, their needs must be addressed quickly and calmly by um, the adults in their life. So it's important that um, babies have, you know, a solid, um, quick response that is calm to their uh, emotional needs as well as their physical needs. So we also add a second new um, uh, factor over here, their um, intellectual cognitive development. Oh, no, sorry. Social development is the other new one, I think. Oh, no. It's over here, too. I lied. It's just one new one. Uh, intellectual cognitive development. By a month old, they can the infant can make contact. Um, by four to five months old, that progresses to the recognition of familiar faces and then to making faces back at those familiar faces. By six months old, they start to make babbling noises. By nine months old, they play peekaboo, um, and the infant starts to understand cause and effect. And by a year old, um, they can follow simple directions. As far as social developments go, the infants become social very quickly by smiling, babbling, and playing games. At around nine months old, the first development of words can be observed, uh, which leads to increased interactions with family. So once the baby starts to talk at about nine months old or starts to babble their first words, then um, the family usually starts to talk more to the infant and try to get the baby to say things back, like say mama, say dada, say papa, or whatever it is. And so um, they, you know, you get that back, uh, more increased, um, interaction with the family there. For physical development, uh, physical, physical development is very rapid during the first year. So during this infant stage, the baby is growing at like warp speed. The general rule is that the baby will triple their birth weight in the first year. So if the baby was born at seven pounds, it'll be about 21 pounds by the time it's a year old. Babies are tested for PKU, which is phenylketonuria. This is a very rare um, metabolic blood disorder caused by a genetic mutation. Um, if a baby is PKU positive, then they will have to go on a special diet. Um, and that PKU test is done during the uh, newborn screening blood work right after the baby is born. So, um, they also during this stage, uh, larger muscle groups develop before smaller groups of muscle. Um, babies develop in a pattern that's called cephalocaudal, meaning that they develop from the top down. So they gain their head control first, then neck and shoulders, and then arms, torso, and then down to their legs. So they will stabilize and get, um, you know, control of the upper body before they learn to walk is basically what it, how it works. And so um, if you've ever been around a baby or had a baby or raised a baby, then you know that's kind of how it works. They learn to sit and then they learn to crawl and then they learn to walk. Um, the nervous system in infants also develops very quickly and their reflexes 
change and uh, hand and eye coordination develops. There's a whole list on page eight, uh, 802 in your textbook that gives you a list of the physical development milestones that um, typically happen for an infant uh, during this um, one month to one year stage. And so you can check that out um, and see all of the milestones there. I'm going backwards. Okay, so the toddler stage is the next stage, and this stage lasts uh, lasts for two years. It's from one to three years, and for physical development, the growth is a little less rapid in this period, but it's still pretty fast, and the cool thing about this stage is the kid's communication skills start to improve and take shape in the use of language. Um, so the kids, they are growing pretty quickly still, not quite as fast as in the first year, but they're growing and they learn how to talk, which is really kind of fun because they say all kinds of funny stuff. Um, their weight gain is going to slow down a little bit between the first and the second year. Um, their arms and legs are going to grow more than their trunk and head, and so they kind of make the kid look a little bit um, more proportionate than it was before. So usually babies have like bigger heads, they kind of look like bobbleheads for a little while, um, but they fill out a little bit you know, when they're a toddler and they look a little bit more proportionate. You will notice this pattern all the way through this lecture. Um, girls usually reach half of their adult height between one and a half and two years old, and boys between two and a half, two and two and a half years. Girls reach all of their milestones before boys in almost every single phase, all the way up to adulthood. I don't know why, we just do. Girls just hit all of the milestones. We, they mature faster, they grow faster, they hit puberty before, and every one of these, um, uh, stages that we're going to go through, girls hit it before boys do. It just, I don't know why. Um, pediatric growth, growth charting is done to track the child's growth in relation to national averages. Um, and there is a whole video up on YouTube and in Canvas for you to show you how to do the pediatric growth charting. Um, it is a where we um, plot on a chart and then the, the plots are ranked by percentiles against national averages. There's also uh, on page 802 in your book um, an example for you to check out. So um, some other milestones, most toddlers walk alone by the time they are 15 months old. At 18 months old, a toddler can kneel, squat, remain upright, and use their pincer grasp. Um, they may spoon feed themselves at that age. I'm not saying it all gets in their mouth, but for the most part, they try. By two, they can run, throw a ball, and scribble. By three, they are very active and can dress themselves, draw shapes, ride a tricycle, and then um, by about two to three years old, most kids are, st are pretty well potty trained um, and can use the toilet. In regards to intellectual cognitive development, toddlers learn about the world through play and imitation and they start to develop independence. Uh, speech occurs between 12 and 15 months old. They know a few single words. At two years old, they start to make sentences using six to 20 words. And by about three years old, they're able to repeat whole nursery rhymes. Um, toddlers, things that toddlers love that help support their intellectual and cognitive development. They love asking, they love books. Um, they love asking why. They love playing with blocks and things that are structured and um, help them um, manipulate things. Um, they love coloring and retelling stories. For social development, um, kids of this age, and between about a year and uh, two years old, toddlers don't really play with other kids as much as they take other kids' stuff. So um, toddlers sometimes aren't, aren't very nice when they're a year to two years old because they are very egocentric. They think that, you know, everything is theirs and so they don't really play with other kids so much as they just take other people's stuff. They don't generally understand uh, the whole sharing well concept until they're about three years old and then they start to play a little bit better with other kids. So it is important for adults um, during this time frame to guide their toddlers on the appropriate behaviors for sharing. In regards to aspects of care for toddlers, um, toddlers can never ever be unsupervised. This is the thing. Toddlers are like little mini 
terroristic ninjas if they are left unsupervised. You cannot ever leave a toddler unsupervised. Toddlers can do more damage unsupervised in a matter of seconds than I don't I don't even know what. But I mean, like they are like little mini atomic bombs running around. They just they're it's a wonder how much damage that these little mini people can do. They need constant attention. Um, it is dangerous to leave a toddler alone. And y'all, I'm not even kidding. I knew a, a lady one time who, um, <laughs> she had a long range, um, uh, nanny cam, like a baby, like a baby monitor. And she would leave her kids on a baby monitor, her toddlers on a baby monitor in the house. And then she'd be two, you know, like two houses down at the neighbor's house in the garage having cocktails in the garage and then just be watching her kids through the baby monitor and I'm like oh my god they could set your house on fire before you could walk two houses down and get them back out of there so you I mean kids are that quick and is that dangerous to leave toddlers unattended so it is important to stress to to people um, the import uh, you know to new parents the importance of um, definitely not ever leaving uh, toddlers unattended because safety is of the utmost importance um, also, and, and other aspects of care, aside from toddler safety, is they need to develop fine motor and language skills at this age. So it's important to, for um, parents to be talking to them and working with them to develop those fine motor and language skills at this age. Uh, we um, also need to let parents know that uh, they have to set limits to help the child develop boundaries and relationships and behavior. Um, but the kid also shouldn't always be in an environment where they're constantly told no either. So there's needs to be boundaries for the kid and also for the parents to not always be telling the kid no. So there's that. Toddlers are fun. Uh, the next stage is preschooler and that goes from three to five years. So socially, three-year-olds may know how to take turns and enjoy group activities. Um, three-year-olds know what gender they are, usually. They like to help um, at three years old. Four-year-olds are very social and enjoy simple group games. At five, the child continues to be very social, likes games where rules are observed. Um, and. Uh, this whole preschool age generally preps kids to go out into the world because it's prepping them to get, get ready to go into, you know, um, the K-12 school system or, you know, uh, out into the world um, for most kids. The physical development of the preschooler, heredity and environment can influence height and weight in these years. So growth should be monitored and compared to the size documented on the child's growth chart and not to other kids in this age group. Um, girls progress more rapidly than boys do. So again, girls are going to hit milestones before boys are. Uh, heart and respiratory rates start to slow down and come closer to their adult ranges in this age. Uh, the bones are going to ossify between ages 2 and 7, so it's important that kids stay active and get lots of calcium in this age. Usually, if a kid has bedwetting problems, um, which is nocturnal enuresis, um, that bed bedwetting will subside by about age 3 to 4. If not, then they can see the doctor for uh, the, to help get um, some answers or solutions to that nocturnal enuresis um, issue. The intellectual and cognitive development, uh, language develops substantially in this age range. At about three years old, a kid will have about 900 words in their vocabulary. By four years old, they have 1,600 words and they are able to develop sentences, complete sentences. At five years old, the child will have about 2,000 words in their vocabulary and they are able to tell complete stories. In regards to psycho-emotional development, at three years old, uh, the three-year-old will like music. Um, they're pretty easy and pleasant. They have an increasing sense of self. They have uh, a lot of imagination. They may also have um, a bit of imagination that gives them some unfounded fears. So like a fear of monsters or a fear of, you know, something um, coming to get them. This tends to be more typical if things um, 
at night. So um, like they may be fearful of the dark or they may be fearful of something under their bed or something in their closet at night. Um, at four years old, negativity starts to increase. Parents hear no, the word no more often coming out of their child's mouth. Um, they start to test their limits and they need to have a little bit more of a guided opportunity for freedom. And at five years old, the child is more self-assured, they're a little bit better adjusted and home-centered, and they like to follow rules a little bit more. Um, so they like to play by the rules a little bit more. And then they become a little, they also become capable of accepting some responsibility, like it's your job every day to make sure that you feed the dog, or it's your job every day to make sure that you make your bed, or it's your job every day to make sure that you put the dishes into the sink after dinner or whatever the case may be. So they like to have some uh, responsibility. As far as care goes, um, the preschoolers need to have vision and hearing screenings again. Those are done, the hearing screenings are done at birth, but they need to be done again at this age. Um, they may need some help managing the night terrors. They need a round of immunizations. We're going to talk in depth about immunizations in a few slides, but they need a round of immunizations. And they also need to have a bedtime routine established um, by this age. All right, so the next stage is the elementary school years. Uh, and those are from about six to 10 years old. Uh, the physical development for this phase uh, finds that girls are often taller and heavier than boys during elementary school years. Permanent teeth are replaced by baby teeth, or excuse me, the permanent teeth uh, replace their baby teeth, so their baby teeth start to fall out. And uh, kids in this age have their bones continue to strengthen and to ossify. Uh, around 10 years old, their reproductive system starts to develop, and so they may start to experience some of the um, characteristics of puberty. And so uh, that comes a little bit more in force uh, in the next phase, but they may notice a few of the symptoms of puberty uh, in the later years of the elementary school phase. For uh, intellectual cognitive kids this age have a brief um, attention span, but this improves around 10 years old. Kids this age like to talk. They develop a sense of right and wrong and of honesty and fairness. Social development, uh, school is essential to the life of kids that are six to 10 years old. They are very sensitive to what they perceive as failure, so it's important to be supportive of kids this age. Uh, Psycho-emotional. Kids around 10 years old may be more influenced by peers than their parents. Um, they are also better able to grasp a concept of time and distance, and they are open to helping other kids at this age. So around 10 years old, when they are uh, more influenced by peers than their parents, that tends to be a bit of a struggle for parents because parents um, sometimes have a little bit of difficulty understanding why all of a sudden their kid um, doesn't value their opinion as much as they seem to value the opinions of their friends. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind there. Uh, six to eight year old kids in this age uh, range may have trouble thinking about disasters that they've heard about. Um, and there are also, these are also the years that kids start to learn and understand gender roles and develop a sense of themselves. Um, for care in this age range, kids need structure and a schedule to maintain order and discipline. Uh, physical activity is encouraged during this age range for health, um, but it also must be done safely if in contact sports. Um, they need regular health and dental care. Communicable diseases are very common in this age because kids are in school um, and they are in close proximity to other kids and so communicable diseases are very common. One of the things that uh, is prevalent right now or that is not, not really prevalent but it is a concern right now is a measles outbreak. Um, and so um, it may be measles right now in the fall and winter months it's flu. Um, and so anything that is communicable is always spread around whenever there's a bunch of kids around. Um, and so, you know, regular health and dental care is uh, important. The middle school years are the next years. Those are 11 to 13 years old. For intellectual and cognitive, um, in this age range, they're 
the child's grades may start to drop a little. Um, kids at this age may have less energy to focus on academics. Uh, this age also tends to exaggerate and bend the truth a little. They start to embellish stories sometimes a little bit. Um, for social development, kids at this age are learning about their, so, uh, their sexual identity, and they may be a little bit weirded out by heterosexual relationships, so like uh, girls may think that boys are gross, or boys may think that girls are gross. Um, girls tend to pursue male and female relationships earlier than boys do, generally. Um, either way, they're going to need an adult that they trust to be able to ask questions and get factual age-appropriate answers from. So that's important to note. Psycho-emotional development. Uh, this age craves independence but lacks self-confidence. So that's a bit of a conundrum. They want to be independent, but they don't have a lot of self-confidence to go independently in the direction that they want to go in. Um, their sexuality has begun to develop at this age, and it's important that kids have a reliable adult to get accurate info from about sex and the changes that their body are going through. So here's the thing. Um, this age is where they are going to get a lot of misinformation from kids around them. And um, kids make up a lot of stuff, and they hear a lot of things, um, sometimes from older siblings, sometimes from uh, the internet, sometimes from TV, um, sometimes they imagine things, you know, they get a lot of misinformation. And so it's super important that kids, uh, especially this age, when they are most impressionable about what is right and what is wrong and what should be um, the truth that they have a grown-up that they can come to and ask questions from. And so it's super awkward. It's creepy sometimes, the things that kids ask. Um, and sometimes it's kind of gross, some of the things that they say. And it is uncomfortable for probably a parent um, and for the kid. Um, I can attest to that. I have raised five kids. And some of the questions that the kids have asked me have um, <laughs> have been doozies. Um, one time my daughter um, asked me a question that she heard about uh, girls talking about on the bus. Some girls had informed her that there was one, she was in middle school uh, in eighth grade, and some girls had informed her that um, there was one particular type of sexual practice um, that they had all been talking about. And um, she asked me what it was, and when she asked me, I asked her why she was asking me, and she told me what she thought it was, and it turned out it was absolutely nothing um, to do with what her friends had had told her it was. Um, it wasn't even the right body part. And so uh, when I told her what it was, she was like, that's so gross. And I said, right. So um, it's important that uh, they are able to get facts and as awkward as that conversation was and as uncomfortable as it made her and me, I am so thankful that um, the kids have always been able to uh, come and ask questions. So much so that when they got older and they um, were in relationships, if they knew something was you know, potentially wrong or they had questions about their bodies or they had questions about sexual health or they had questions about birth control or anything like that, they knew that they could always come to us, me, um, and ask and that I would, you know, give them facts. Um, and and the, the basic um, premise when you are dealing with kids is to always be age appropriate and also to, for parents to remember that, um, you know, while it may be awkward and it may be uncomfortable for both the kids and the parents, um, it is better to be educating the kids um, from something that is preventable and potentially dangerous for them um, rather than avoiding difficult conversations and not protecting them from a disease that could potentially kill them later on because of a conversation that, you know, nobody wanted to have or because a child got information from somebody that was misinformed or, you know, telling them half-truths. So that's the thing is it's very, very important that um, kids have these 
um, adults that they are able to go and to talk to. Um, there's a lot of stuff in middle school and high school that goes on with kids' bodies um, where they start to develop um, and they have their little hormones are going crazy and you know it's weird and it's awkward and, and you know things are happening to them that they don't understand. Um, and then they've got on top of that all these kids that are telling them all kinds of crazy stuff. So um, all their friends, ever, it's happening to everybody, and nobody really knows what's going on. And so everybody just kind of uh, says a lot of things about it. And so you know that just all lends to the fact that it is very important that parents are open um, and able to initiate these conversations when their kids don't want to, and parents are you know hyper aware of what may be going on with their kids and are able to um, have these discussions with their kids and keep it you know everything kind of out there on the table and and um, open. Um, okay, so parents may also be confused or conflicted by their kid that is suddenly annoyed at everything um, or annoyed super is easily. That happens in the middle school years. That's when they start to cap their little attitudes and they uh, all of a sudden are like super annoyed or they're annoyed at everything. Everything bugs them. Um, and the other thing to know is, uh, and this is, they have this uh, worded differently in your textbook so you can go check that out. But, oh, sorry, my computer dinged. Um, but kids um, are who they run with at this age. And what I mean by that is, is that kids um, take on the habits of their friends. And so it is very important during the middle school years to, for parents to watch who their kids are associating with. Um, if your child is associating with members of the chess team, then obviously um, the odds are much greater that your kid's going to develop a, an interest in chess. If your kids uh, are in organized sports, then they're probably going to develop an interest for organized sports. Um, if your kids are running around with the kids who are out after curfew and you know, doing donuts in the parking lot, then that's probably going to be what your kid's doing. Even though you trust your kid, um, parents trust their kids, um, it, it, kids take on the habits of their group of friends. And so uh, it is incredibly important to know who their children are, are friends with and who they're associating with. Um, so not just their, uh, the kids, but their parents too. Because, you know, sometimes kids are coming from places where maybe the parents aren't always right either. Um, for physical development, puberty happens at this stage, which is super fun if you've ever raised a kid going through puberty. Um, puberty for girls is about 12 or 13 years old. For boys, it happens a little bit later, around 14 years old. The physiological changes that make a person capable of reproduction is what occurs during puberty. So for girls, um, there are some unique characteristics, and for some boys, there are some unique characteristics, and then there's some characteristics that happen for both of them. So for both of them, they are going to both boys and girls are going to grow taller, they're going to gain weight, um, may develop acne, body hair is going to start growing, um, and their voices will deepen, um, and for both of them, uh, they will have an increased muscle mass. For girls, estrogen production will go underway, um, they will um, have mature eggs start producing, um, they'll have their first period, hips will widen, breasts will develop, and then uh, the girl's shape will become more rounded. For boys, uh, their shoulders will broaden, testosterone production will begin, sperm production will start, their external genitalia will grow, they may have wet dreams, uh, they'll start to get facial hair. That always freaks me out. The facial hair is what freaks me out the most. Speaking of facial hair, there's my youngest one. Um, the and then they start to develop um, significant musculature. And so it's, it's kind of creepy, it, it, I don't know. I've raised um, both girl, girls and boys. We have three boys and two girls. And so with the girls, it's like, oh, you start to notice that they, um, when they hit puberty, you start to notice that they might need a training bra. And then you start to notice that they're starting to get a little curvier and that you got to buy them different, you know, shaped pants or whatever. And uh, sometimes, at least for my girls. And then with the boys, it's like they have these little cracking um, <laughs> prepubescent voices and they sound like your daughters for the longest time. And then all of a the sudden, they just sound like men. 
and it's creepy. And then you turn around and they've got like chin hairs and armpit hairs and then they're like little ripped kids and I don't I don't even know what happened. I don't I don't know. The whole that's my my son back there coughing. Um so they just I don't know. The puberty fun uh the puberty stage is, is fun. So um it if it creeps moms out I don't know, it creeped me out a little bit. But if it creeps moms out, I can imagine it probably keeps creeps the kids out. And this is the thing. Um, when kids are going through this, it's important to remember that it was probably awful when you went through it. So, you know, it sucks for the kids. So that's important to remember as well. All right, so last up on the middle school years, uh, care. They need to know uh, in this age that they are both valued and loved. They need to have consistent discipline. Um, parents should not be hypocritical during this stage they kids at this age are very very impressionable um, and it is important to monitor friendships at this age again because kids are who they run with and so you don't want your kid to be hanging out with all of the rowdy kids and then be a rowdy kid so you know watch out who your kids are hanging out with all right next stage is the adolescent years oh man you thought those middle school years were bad mm. these teenage years yikes all right, so for psycho-emotional, teens know the socially, socially, I said socially, so weird, socially acceptable and appropriate way to express their feelings, but the pressures that they feel uh, may result in angry outbursts. Well, let me tell y'all, I've lived through a lot of those. That is just facts right there. Um, so they know that they aren't supposed to like uh, blow up, but sometimes they do. Thankfully, most of the time they reserve it for home, um, so unfortunately parents get the brunt of that, but at least it's not happening out in public where it could get them in trouble. Um, the problem is that, uh, holding the anger in can be harmful. So it's good that they get it out. It sucks that it happens, um, you know, to be released on parents most of the time, but it's good that they get it out because holding all the anger in can be harmful. Um, anxiety and sometimes depression are a pretty common part of adolescence. Uh, a lot of kids are uh, depressed at some point throughout their teenage years and many, many kids have anxiety throughout their teenage years. There was just a study released um, just last week that said that the um, number of visits to hospitals let me rephrase that. So the number of um, teenagers who visited emergency rooms in the United States for suicidal thoughts or attempts more than doubled between 2007 and 2015. Um, and so they had sampled all of these emergency rooms and researchers then tracked the number of children between um, the ages of 5 and 18 who received a diagnosis of suicidal ideation or suicidal attempts um, each of those years between like 2007 and 2015. And so um, those diagnoses of either of those two conditions increased from 580,000 in 2007 to 1.12 1 million in 2015. So that is like an insane increase over the course of, you know, what, seven, eight years? Eight years. So in eight years, it more than doubled. Um, the average age of the child at the time of evaluation was about 13. And 43% uh, of the visits um, were in children between 5 and 11. So again, um, just kind of stepping backwards to that middle school age uh, phase, that is when kids are most impressionable and where they really start to need adults. And then they move into this adolescent phase. So if they don't get support there, they're definitely going to have problems over here in this adolescent phase. So it is, um, you know, really important that they have the psycho-emotional support um, to be able to develop well. Um, so just throwing that out there. Intellectual cognitive development. Teens no longer have um, 
they no longer take the word of adults as kind of like the gospel truth, if you will. Um, they start asking questions and they start forming their own opinions and working out their own values. Now, this can sometimes cause a conflict with parents because parents are um, often tasked with teaching their kids right from wrong or teaching their kids the right way to do things or teach, you know, giving their kids their, their foundation and their beliefs. And so, for example, if a parent um, has taught their child to be pro-choice all along and then their kids go to school and, you know, they have groups of friends and they are on social media and they are able to get on Google and they do research and they, you know, are influenced by all of these outside factors outside of their parents' foundational beliefs and they start to form their own opinion and they're like, you know what? I don't, I don't think I believe the same thing that you believe anymore. And that's okay for you to believe it, mom and dad, but I don't, I don't really want to be, um, pro choice anymore. I want to be whatever. And so, um, that sometimes can cause conflicts within, um, or strain on the parent child relationship. And so it's important here for parents to understand that this is a part of growing up for the kid. The kid is going to, um, especially in the teenage years, need, this is a life skill. A, a teenager is going to have to, um, be able to you know, reason and develop and research and ask questions and form their own opinions and start to work out and base their, you know, develop their own values and um, those types of things because that's what's going to set them up for adulthood. And so even though it may be a, a painful point for an adult uh, or for a parent at some point throughout their relationship with their child, um, parents should try to find a way to mediate and be supportive of the fact that their child is trying to you know, essentially learn how to adult on their own and learn who they are. Um, teens do not often see the connection between behavior and consequences, unfortunately. And so this uh, sometimes can lead to risky experimentation and behaviors, you know, with drugs, alcohol, risky sexual behaviors. Um, and so teens mistakenly have this um, lack of fear that anything bad can happen to them. And so they're like, oh man, you know, I know that everybody smokes weed and drives and it's cool because I'm, I'm good. I, I can smoke all day long and I'm driving, I'm straight. Like everybody, nothing's, nothing's going to happen to me. Or, you know, I understand that there's that whole um, risk of uh, human trafficking, but it's okay because that's not me. Like nobody's ever going to traffic me um, if I put myself in a, in a similar risky situation. Or it's okay. Um, we can use the pull and pray method because there's no possible way I'm ever going to get a pregnant as a teenager. Um, and so, you know, kids, uh, teenagers in particular, don't have this um, innate ability to see the consequences. And it's crazy because I feel like um, once you're an adult, you're scared of freaking everything. Like, I, I feel like once you're an adult, you that's all you think about is the consequence to a behavior. Before you ever do the behavior, before you ever perform an action, you automatically start to think about the consequences. And so it's kind of insane the role reversal that happens for the next, like, 10 to 15 years after your teenage years, because I feel like you're going um, from not being able to associate consequences to behaviors to always associating consequences to behaviors um, for you know, pretty much all of adulthood. So the good news is that they grow out of that. The bad news is, is that you have to get them through those years without permanent damage before they grow out of that. For uh, physical um, development, females will reach their adult height and weight in their late teen years. Males will grow in height until they're about 25 years old. Not much. I mean, usually by the time they're like 18, 19, and it's pretty much set, but they will continue to grow a little bit in height until they're 25 years old. Teens uh, need exercise and diet. Lifestyles can be an indicator for adulthood healthy behaviors. So um, how they are into their teen years um, can be a pretty good indicator for, you know, their adult years. So if they are uh, not um, living a very healthy lifestyle in their late teen years, then, you know, that could be an indicator that they're going to have some health struggles or weight struggles, um, whatever it is, uh, into their adult years as well. 
Social development, friendships are very important to teenagers. Um, they need to have friendships um, as a source of support. Um, older teens become comfortable with parents and outgrow their attitude a little bit. And I can attest to this uh, now. We have older teenagers now. We have a couple of 19-year-olds um, and uh, one who is almost 17. And it's kind of cool. The 19-year-olds now want to hang out with us again, where before when they were younger, like 13, um, 14, 15, they wanted to stay away from us as, pos as much as possible. And now that they're like 19, now the one comes home from college as often as she can and the other one he still lives at home so you know he's on the weekends he's hanging out with his dad and so it's kind of nice uh, that they kind of outgrow their little attitudes a little bit and uh, they want to hang out with you so um, kind of nice that they they uh, hang out uh, and you become kind of okay again <laughs> Um, teens face a lot of challenges. Um, some of the th challenges that they can face are eating disorders, uh, sexually transmitted infections, substance abuse issues, suicide ideations, um, and then violence, both um, domestic and also uh, family violence situations. Care for teenagers. Teenagers need adequate calcium and exercise. Um, teenagers should know the risks of early unplanned pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections when they become sexually active. They need to spend time enjoying a social life with people outside of their family. That's important for their uh, development. People caring for teenagers should listen. They should give them facts. They should trust teenagers, which is hard to do sometimes, but they should. Um, they should be consistent be a good example, um, provide firm and friendly discipline, set limits and stick to them, educate them to be independent, and then last but definitely not least, remember how it felt to be a teenager. You know it sucks to be a teenager. You're trying to be independent, um, trying to do your own thing, trying to live your life, and then you got your parents all the time telling you you can't do it, or telling you to do it another way, or trying to, you know, make you do things their way or whatever the case may be it's hard it's hard to be a teenager you want to go but you don't got a license and you can't drive or you, you know you got to borrow your parents car or you got curfews or you have no money or whatever the case may be um, being a teenager is uh, it's hard to do sometimes so just try to remember how it felt to be a teenager uh, when dealing with teenagers all right so um, for General checkups um, for these various life stages. We first come to the well child checkups. Um, we have infants. There are seven well baby exams um, at, and those occur at three to five days old, one month, two months, four months, six months, nine months, and one year old. We have toddler checkups. Those happen at 15 months, 18 months, 24 months, and 30 months. After three years old, kid has an annual checkup. Um, you can check out page uh, 809. Table 40-2 for the components of each exam per their age ranges. I definitely think you should check that out. Uh, gives you some good information there. General tips for these well child checks. Uh, parents should undress a child down to a dry diaper and then keep them warm until the doctor's in to see them. Pacifiers can soothe the crying baby um, so that the doctor can hear the chest sounds easier. Crying makes it hard to hear the uh, chest sounds and so you know we want to try to keep the baby calm and quiet. The child should not be fed during the exam so that the stomach sounds do not interfere with listening to other body sounds. You may need to distract the child uh, with toys to help the exam go more smoothly. Um, another thing to remember is that kids may be afraid of you because you're a stranger so you want to approach uh, slowly uh, approach the baby slowly or the kid slowly and smile and speak gently to them. And here's another important tip for you. As the medical assistant, you want to make sure that you get on their level if you can. So if you're going into a room with a toddler or a young younger kid, get down on their level. Um, sit down on the floor beside them if you can or sit on the chair beside them um, if you can to do their vitals or whatever it is. When you get down on, your on their level you are much less scary to them um, because they see you as equal and not as another crazy adult. 
Um, if you need to do a procedure, make sure you do it calmly and quickly, and then ask the parent to help restrain them if it's necessary for their safety. So if you have to do a blood draw or a vaccination or, you know, whatever it is, then we don't want to um, hurt the kid any more than we need to. And so if you have to have the parent hold them, um, then, you know, that's the best way to do it so you can get it done quickly and efficiently. Immunizations. Oh, I love immunizations. I did a whole entire thesis on this in grad school. So um, here is some really important information about immunizations. Okay, so you should first know how vaccinations work. Um, there are two types of vaccines. There is live attenuated, which is a weakened form of a virus, and then there is an inactivated version. And these are either a whole virus, a whole bacteria, or a fractionated version of either a virus or bacteria, okay? And um, if you have a live attenuated dose, you only usually need one uh, dose of that vaccination. If you have an inactivated, if, you're re if a person is receiving an inactivated version of this um, uh, vaccination, then they're gonna need multiple doses. So just kind of keep that in mind. But how these vaccines work, uh, vaccines help to develop immunity because they imitate an infection. The vaccine does not cause an infection. Instead, it prompts the immune system to make T lymphocytes and antibodies that will remember which are very specific type of um, T lymphocytes or type of white blood cell. And then antibodies are part of your um, immune system um, uh, like warriors, like uh, army, and they will remember that infection if it's ever introduced to the body again. And so giving this form uh, protects the, the body from potentially deadly, the, the potentially deadly form if it's exposed. And so basically what happens is we give a weakened form um, to the body, and that prompts the immune system to be like, oh, hey, you don't belong here. And then they go out, they attack the weakened form, the weakened form, which does not make you sick. Um, they go out, they attack the weakened form, and then your immune system has this really cool feature where it remembers things that have been introduced to the body that don't belong there, and then it remembers it. Um, and so if, um, say, for example, after you've had the mumps vaccination, the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccination, um, if uh, measles, mumps, or rubella, actually the virus, like right now there's measles going around, if you were exposed to measles and the measles virus um, enters your body and you've had the vaccination, then your body is like, oh no, 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 you don't belong here, and it kills it. And so you don't actually get measles because you've had this vaccination. So um, what we um, do is make sure that um, all of the parents of children that are brought, brought into the clinic are recommended that we are recommending um, vaccinations to all of the parents. Now there is a large uh, group of um, parents that are known as anti-vaxxers and they have for one reason or another um, been informed and believe that vaccinations are um, harmful to their children and so they choose not to vaccinate their children for one reason or another and so um, the thing with vaccinations is that uh, if enough of a population is vaccinated, it can provide herd immunity to uh, some of the people in the population that are not vaccinated. Um, but that doesn't work if le you know the few with a f uh, fewer and fewer amounts of people that are vaccinated. So it is important that um, the majority of the populations are vaccinated. Um, vaccinations have eradicated diseases that previously that we are now seeing um, evolve again, such as measles. We hadn't heard of measles cases in quite some time um, until recently, and that is because um, of, you know, people not vaccinating. So you can uh, check out how herd immunity works. Um, you can Google that, and uh, definitely parents are going to make um, whatever decisions they feel is right for their kids. Their uh, vaccinations is such a big deal that there are actually um, some public institutions that have made it illegal for a child to enter without appropriate vaccinations. So, um, it, I mean, it, it's a it's a big deal.
Um, as far as recommendations go, let me blow this up for you. CDC recommendations, um, there are uh, several of them, and this is the schedule for birth of six years, the vaccination schedule there, and then um, it thins out a little bit, but there are a few more um, booster shots to go on the seven to 18 years um, um, as the kid goes through the elementary and high school years, and then there's a um, meningitis vaccination um, when the um, kid goes off to college as well. Uh, also, you as healthcare workers, there's a whole entire CDC vaccination uh, schedule for healthcare workers. Now, you guys have to have your vaccinations current before I will let you go out onto your clinical sites. That's because most of you are going to Kaiser or Sutter or to hospitals, um, and you are not allowed in the hospital without vaccinations um, to perform clinical duties. So, you as those vaccinations that you're required to have even to step foot in there are minimal compared to what you should have as a healthcare worker. So the CDC has a whole entire um, recommendation for healthcare workers um, that you can check out on the CDC's immunization uh, website, the vaccination website. And you should definitely get all of your vaccinations up to date because you want to be well vaccinated, especially when you are exposed to many communicable diseases while working with patients. All right, so back to kids. Contraindications, um, some reasons to not give an immunization. Um, there are, uh, sometimes people have these contraindications. Sometimes there are people who are immunocompromi immunocompromised. Um, like for instance, uh, pertussis vaccination isn't given to a child with a progressive neurologic disorder or to uh, one who has had specific reactions after the first dose of a medication. So if they had an inactivated um, uh, vaccination and that's one that needs multiple doses. For example, um, um, if they have had a uh, the IPV vaccination and they had a, uh, had it at two months and then they had a uh, specific reaction to that, the doctor may advise that they don't get it again at uh, four months and six months. Um, so, you know, that is up to the doctor. The doctor will decide the next steps on the remaining vaccinations based on the reaction. Now, those reactions do not include things like um, uh, there may be some local um, reaction that is, oh, hang on just a second, let me get rid of that. There we go. Um, there may be some local site reaction, like a little redness or tenderness around the injection site. That's pretty common. The reactions that would warrant not giving another immunization are pretty um, substantial. So like a really high fever or severe vomiting or things like that. So again, that's going to be up to the doctor to decide. But um, parents are um, informed of all of the risks and also all of the um, symptoms and side effects, potential side effects to look for to report to the doctor prior to giving the child a vaccination. Um, and that is part of this next part, next uh, section right here called informed consent. So parents must have the risks versus benefits of the immunization explained to them and also any potential side effects that they need to look out for and should report to the physician after the vaccination. If they agree to all that, then they sign a consent form, which we have to have before vaccination can be administered to the child. Um, the medical assistant's role in the vaccination, you want to make sure that you use the correct site. Um, so depending on the age of the child, it may be deltoid, it may be uh, vastus lateralis in the thigh, um, it could be gluteal. Not very often is it gluteal. Um, it's usually vastus on babies or deltoid in the older kids uh, and adults. Um, you want to make sure that you administer the vaccine correctly. That is super important. Uh, check the vaccine, uh, the vaccine storage daily for temperatures uh, and other things. Uh, some of the vaccinations have to be uh, stored in the refrigerator. And so if the fridge goes out or the temperature is not correct in the refrigerator, then those vaccinations could be um, damaged or no good. You want to check expiration dates and rotate the stock of the vaccines that are on hand. And also make sure that we are providing education for parents. Uh, again, letting them know what side effects uh, to look out for, anything that they should potentially report to the doctor after the vaccination. 
For immunization records, they include the vaccination type, the manufacturer, lot number, date and time given, the date of administration, name, address, and title of the healthcare professional that administered the vaccination. That's all part of the permanent vaccination record. Um, parent record, so that's all going to go in their chart. The parent record looks a little bit something like this. Um, I don't, they don't all look like this. This is just one that I found on the CDC website. Um, but all of the parent uh, records will have basically the same thing. It's going to have the um, uh, vaccination and then a spot to write down the date that it happened, that the vaccination was given and some initials or something to note that the vaccination was administered. So again, all of the child's vaccination are going to go in the official immunization record and the chart, in the patient's chart. Um, also, they are reported to the Board of Health locally. All right, so I would love to argue with you about vaccinations. Um, so if you want to do that in class, let me know. But for now, we move on to make this smaller. Uh, other screening and di oh my gosh, screening and diagnostic tests. Um, we have vitals. Uh, getting vitals from kids can be hard sometimes since they're likely to cry or become agitated. Um, pulse, respiration, and blood pressure are done first, and then we do their temperature. This is so that they're not the pulse, um, respiration, and blood temp, uh, blood pressure are not elevated secondary to a kid being upset by you trying to shove something in his mouth. So just an idea there. Um, no oral temperatures are done on patients younger than five. Usually we do the temporal one where we uh, run it across their forehead. Blood pressures are uh, usually only done uh, by physician's order, so it's whether the physician prefers you to do a blood pressure. Um, uh, but you do need to know that kids, pediatrics, have um, different normal blood pressure ranges than adults do. So that 120 over 80 metric doesn't apply to kids. So check your book for those. Um, and actually, I think in the vital section, when we went through that chapter, I put a, a pediatrics chart up for you uh, in that little handout that I gave you. Eye and vision exam. The, phys the physician will do a general exam of the eye with an ophthalmoscope. Once the kids are older, they will use the pediatric uh, visual acuity chart. You want to watch, if you're doing the acuity uh, exam with the kids, you want to watch for signs of visual difficulty during tests, like during the test, like squinting or leaning forward or head tilting, things like that. Uh, for kids, we typically start with the 40 or 30 foot line and then work down to the 20 foot line. Note any focusing issues with the child's eyes on the chart. Um, use a pointer to select one object at a time so that the patient doesn't memorize the order. So here's the thing with the pediatric chart. Usually, um, instead of doing the letter chart, it is uh, the letter Snellen chart. It's usually a, a symbol like sailboat, um, a star, a ball, things like that. And so you don't want the kid to memorize the order on the chart. Um, so you can use a pointer and have them tell you what that object is. Um, it's usually a little bit more fun for the kids if you can make a game out of the testing. So just a thought there. For hearing uh, and ear exams, ear infections happen a lot with little kids. They are often linked to upper respiratory infections. And that is because the fluids collect easily in kids' ears uh, as they come down um, from the uh, from the fluids collect easily in kids ears and promote bacterial growth um, and that fluid um, sometimes is linked to those upper respiratory infections and them snucking snot through down through their nose and all that kind of gross stuff you can see page 815 uh, for assisting with hearing exam tips if hearing loss is suspected or ear damage is evident then the child is likely going to be referred out to an ENT or audiology to have their hearing tested or an ENT to see if tubes need to be put in their ears to drain out uh, uh, long-term or recurrent ear infections. Body measurements um, are weighed at every visit so height, weight, Weight at every visit. Um, the length is going to be plotted until they're three years old and then annually after that. Um, head circumference is measured also to check for hydrocephalus um, and that's checked until they are I think 18 months maybe 24 months I don't know check your textbook on that one. 
For diagnostic text testing, uh, some common diagnostic tests that happen with kids this uh, throughout the pediatric years, throat cultures, strep is easily uh, passed around with kids um, because it's communicable and you know kids are in close proximity to each other. Strep can be especially serious in a child, um, so rapid strep tests are done pretty often. The child may resist having a throat swab done or refuse to open their mouth, so you may have to have a parent plug the child's nose um, to gently force their mouth open so that you can hurry up and reach back in there and swab their uh, tonsillar area. Urine specimens are done um, pretty often with kids too. You always want to explain the procedure thoroughly, uh, age appropriately of course. Uh, on an infant who is not potty trained, that may be collected using a U bag, a urine bag, which is taped to their genitals, or collected um, in an older child with a, a cup in the traditional manner, um, in which case you would have their parent, you know, help assist with that. Blood draws are um, done often in kids too. Um, infant veins are often uh, too small, so on infants, on tiny babies, we do heel sticks. Um, you want to have the parents hold the kids. Uh, you know, once the baby is about a year old, it's not so bad to get a blood draw out of a baby. Um, it's just when they're teeny tiny that we have to do heel sticks a lot of times. You want to have the parents hold the baby if, the, if it's possible. Um, and then while you're drawing kids, you want to uh, comfort and praise them during the process. Uh, and so, um, you know, try to help keep them calm. Okay, uh, last page. We have common diseases and disorders found in children. Uh, asthma is a pretty common disorder um, in both children and adults. Um, more so in children, though sometimes kids outgrow it by the time they hit adulthood. Asthma is the inflammation of the airway caused by triggers. Um, the treatment is often avoiding triggers and uh, the use of inhaled medications for long-term treatment. And uh, also there's uh, some inhaled medications for quick relief of symptoms, so uh, the use of inhalers. Sorry if you caught the tail end of my cough there. I tried to pause it before I coughed. I mean, allergies are bad this week. Um, head lice, small insects that spread via head-to-head -head contact or the sharing of combs and uh, hairbrushes. Treatment is anti-lice shampoo, a fine tooth comb to remove eggs, which are known as nits, from the hair shafts. Um, clothing, bedding, stuffed toys need to be uh, sealed and disinfected to kill off the lice and their eggs. HSV is a herpes simplex virus. It causes cold sores on the mouth. The treatment is a, an ointment, a medicated ointment, and also to avoid sun, which can uh, exacerbate the cold sores. Impetigo is a highly contagious staph or strep bacterial infection on the skin. Treatment there is to avoid scratching the lesions, the sharing of utensils, towels, bed linens, bath, or pool water um, that could infect another uh, person. Pink eye is also a highly contagious um, and infectious conjunctivitis that is uh, from a strep or staph bacterial infection of the conjunctiva of the eye. So it is transmitted by direct contact. Um, most of the time uh, somebody will scratch their eye and then touch something else um, or touch the other eye. So treatment is to avoid scratching eyes, um, the use of warm comp compresses to draw out the exudate or the the um, pus and to or the infection and um, also the use of antibiotics, uh, ointments and drops. Pinworms are transmitted by swallowing worm eggs or by touching something infected uh, that an infected person touched. The treatment um, is provided for the whole family in the case of pinworms to treat worms and prevent the spread of worms because it's hard not to know what you know what an infected person touched so we treat the whole family. Ringworms are a contagious uh, fungal infection of the scalp growing or growing or feet. Uh, sometimes it affects other areas of the body too. Ringworm can show up anywhere, but typically it affects those uh, those three places most often. Treatment is oral and topical antifungal medications, frequent changing of towels and bedding, and also no sharing of personal items because it is contagious. 
Uh, scarlet fever is a red rash that starts as patches and then turns to fine bumps. Treatment for scarlet fever is um, antibiotics, which are needed to clear the symptoms of the fever, uh, sore throat, chills, vomiting, and abdominal pain. So if left untreated, rheumatic fever and kidney disease can occur um, and actually um, if the scarlet fever turns into rheumatic fever and the rheumatic fever is left untreated it can turn into mitral valve prolapse so that's even worse that's uh, heart damage there strep throat is pretty common in kids also it's contagious spread by droplets so kids who you know when people don't cover their mouth and they cough and uh, those droplets go out into the air um, from their saliva it is spread that way it can progress to rheumatic fever as well if left untreated so uh, strep throat is treated with antibiotics as soon as possible um, there are some less common diseases in pediatrics uh, over on page 817 and 18, 819, 817, 818, and 819. Oh my lord. Um, that you need to check out as well. But this lecture took forever to write out and it is super long already. Uh, so I stopped writing. So you guys can um, go check those out in your um, Learn Smart text or in your uh, physical textbook. So if you have any questions, uh, I will see you in class on Tuesday. Thanks.